Uh, Ma'am, shall I start? Okay. A very good morning to one and all. I, Shashwat Nigam, on behalf of Government Girls PG College Ujjain, heartily welcome the invited speakers, all dignitaries, honorable principal sir, staff members, and all the participants to the second day of seven day e-awareness program on wildlife conservation in India, the changing paradigm organized by zoology and biotechnology department of government girls PG college Ujjain, Madhya Pradesh, a center for excellence, a graded by NAC in two cycles under the edges of MPHEQIP World Bank scheme and supported by internal quality assurance SEM. The program is presided by our principal and patron, Dr. H. L. Anijwal, sir. His constant support and motivation always encourages us. Today, on the second day of e-awareness program, we have with us Dr. Ponavali N. Kumara, principal scientist, conservation of biology, Salim Ali Center for Ornithology and uh, Natural History, Anaikati, Tamil Nadu. We feel overwhelmed to have such an eminent personality with us. Yesterday, we have discussed about the role of protected areas in conserving wildlife. And today, we will explore some more about wildlife preservation through conservation stories. A tremendous effort has been made by our country at national level to curb out this issue. And India has also launched various campaigns, acts, and policies. India has initiated various conservation projects like Project Tiger, Project Elephant, Sea Turtle Project, Crocodile Conservation Project, Vulture and Dolphin Conservation Project, Captive Breeding Program, and many more. In a deeper analysis, it will appear that protecting wildlife is a vital for the present as well as future generations. Life in the wild promotes biological diversity, which in turn provides materials for food, clothing, medicines, papers, beverages, and spices for daily life. Thus, in this program, we are going to aware with all the aspects of wildlife conservation. And today, we will get to know about some conservation stories from Western Guards. The participants are requested to write their queries in the YouTube comment section below. And all their queries will be resolved after completion of the talk of the distinguished speaker. I once again welcome our eminent speaker and all the participants. Now, I invite Ms. Shiva Khan, Faculty of Biotechnology, for the guest introduction. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Shastra, sir. Thank you, Shastra, sir. Sorry for the interruption. Thanks, sir, for giving me this opportunity to introduce our today's invited eminent speaker. A very good morning and again, welcome you all. As we all are gathered here to celebrating Wildlife Conservation Week, today we have with us our invited speaker, Dr. H. N. Kumara, Principal Scientist, Conservation of Biology, Salim Ali Center for Ornithology and Natural History, Aniakati, Tamil Nadu. Dr. H. N. Kumara obtained his PhD degree from the University of Mysore for 
has studied an ecological assessment of mammal in known sanctuary areas of Karnataka. The study provided a distribution pattern for about 10 lesser known species and identified the potential populations for many endemic and endangered species. Before his PhD, he was involved in studies on the distribution of mammals, ecology, and behavior of mammals, especially on primates in the animalian, uh, sorry, is Anamalai Hills, and he studied the adaptation of lion tail, lion tail maca to the changing habitat in the fragments, documented the male influx, infantis, infanticides, and female transfer in bonnage maca, and documented the distribution range of natural slender lorises in entire South India. He identified the forest areas for conservation for threatened species in southern states and played a role in strengthening of the protected area network. He studied the elephant in South Bengal, the impact of windmill on birds and mammals in Karnataka, animals of the burrows in Bharatpur and Maka and all of the ice age. He has over 110 publications and four book chapters for his credited. After his PhD, he was in NIAS as a young scientist and he joined the second as a scientist on 1st March 2010. Now, I invite sir to enlighten us with his thought, his Topic of today's talk is conservation story from the Central Western Ghats. I hand over to you, sir. Thanks and welcome. Good morning. Good morning to all of you. And, uh, you know, uh, thanks for uh, giving this opportunity to share some of our uh, findings from uh, Central Western Ghats. And uh, uh, I don't know how many are uh, familiar with the uh, Western Ghats. And uh, I would like to take all of you people to a uh, different uh, uh, landscape. Uh, and uh, uh, whatever that some of the studies that we have done, and I will showcase it. And uh, before uh, going to uh, Light Tail Maka, even uh, some of the basic understanding of uh, uh, conservation conservation biology and uh, uh, you know, Western Ghats, I would like to breathe, and then uh, I will uh, go to Light and Macaque. I will just share uh, my slides. So, is the slide is visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is visible, sir. Okay, fine. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, and uh, thanks for the, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Ma'am, uh, giving a kind of a brief introduction for me also, and uh, Lena, ma'am, also. Now, I will start my talk, Conservation Story from the Central Western Guards. Conservation, before, be, here I have used the two terms. One is conservation, another one is Western Guards, and the focus is on uh, the light-tailed macaque. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, uh, you know, this particular species and also this landscape and, uh, you know, conservation. So, uh, uh, I will go by part by part, conservation, western cars, and light-tailed macaque. So, conservation. 
conservation uh, you know the term when it has really taken a shape and uh, uh, you know that is very uh, you know interesting thing to uh, see it. Uh, as you know that homo sapiens that means we people are part of the ecosystem we are not uh, you know alien to the this ecosystem we are part of it basically but uh, it, you know in the older period uh, several decades or uh, uh, centuries back if you look at it and uh, people were depending on the entire ecosystem for the minimum requirement, even including the animals. So they used to hunt and people used to depend on their pot, you know, for, for their pot on uh, wild animals. But over the period, uh, as we established ourselves and uh, based on our intelligence, uh, we considered animals as a pest and uh, several centuries uh, you know agriculture uh, has become a part of our life and uh, treated uh, these animals as pests and pest controlling has become part of our system so whenever people used to complain you know in the last probably uh, two uh, or probably couple of thousand years 2000 years you can say that one that the kings used to rule and uh, people when the people complain about uh, animals they are damaging their uh, crop people that, that is the time only they used to go and hunt these animals only in uh, those areas otherwise the people used to depend on these wild animals only for what but eventually in the last one or one and a half century it has taken a different shape way. it has become a kind of a sport hunting so earlier it was for a part then pest then it sports this has led ultimately to large scale of a hunting and mass hunting used to happen and uh, Apart from this hunting, that's a direct elimination of these animals from the nature. We also started using all the, these landscapes by removing the forest and uh, it may be for minerals and a lot of developmental activities, burning of nature. Many of these things ultimately has led to several crises on the earth. What are all those crises basically? Those crises are considered as biodiversity crisis or extinction crisis. I think, you know, here, the, one of the major issue was biodiversity loss and over harvest of species. Here I'm giving a, just one example, passenger pigeon in America, and this is the passenger pigeon. At one point of a time, it was thought that they are abundant they never go extinct and they were like the way we have you know right now the maybe crows or minas or, you know like most commonest probably dow uh, pigeon couple of them that's a blue rock pigeon that's a very commonest one which colonizer we, the, we, you cannot think that many of these species will go extinct it was in the same way that passenger pigeon used to live in a larger flocks and and people started hunting and the hunting it has become a when it has become a sport in a single day people used to kill so many birds and ultimately by 70 and 90 it has drastically reduced and for the last one century there are no records of this particular species almost the species is got extinct. This is loss of, uh, you know, the species. And also this is due to over harvest of the species. This type of activities have led to species to disappear from the earth. Like that, even habitat loss and fragmentation. For example, if you take this pink headed dog in the, in the nature, there are several species of animals that are highly specialized animals. 
they are confined to very smaller niche, smaller habitat on earth. And if something goes wrong with that particular patch or the habitat, there is a possibility of these species will disappear. Here I am giving an example that almost from a 70, 80 years, many of these species are not being recorded. They are highly specialist animal and they have disappeared due to habitat loss. I take to another you know, uh, crisis that is disruption of ecosystem function. And this is one of the important concepts that we need to do it because now agriculture has become very important part of our life as the human population growing to feed them, we have to cultivate more uh, you know, food. So there is so much of research happened and people have started using so much of uh, uh, you know, menus and there is uh, organic and non-organic, all, all, all possible these kind of things came to the picture. Many of what happened is excessive use of uh, many of these nutrients in the agricultural field, in, uh, especially in Mexico. It is a, one of the typical example I am giving it here. And over the period, you know, during after the rainfall, uh, rainfall, and many of these things also got washed to the uh, you know, water, uh, the, you know, river system, through river system, got to the even marine system. And ultimately, the amount of these nutrients increased in the water, even in the ocean. And there was a kind of an algal bloom happened and the oxygen level totally dropped. And now this is known as a dead zone because it killed all the life almost somewhere around 8,000 square miles. That is a kind of a you know huge area has lost its complete life. And this is one of the uh, you know, major issue that we are also facing it on this earth. Climate change. And some people say, yes, there is a change in the climate. Some people say there is always the debate going on. But I don't want to really get into that change. But one uh, apparent thing over the period, if you look at it, there is a steady increase in the temperature. There are certain species of animals on the earth that are highly specialized and they have occupied the niche of a specific temperature in the ocean that is coral reefs. Even if there is a one degree of uh, Celsius varies in the ocean, and uh, in the particular strata, the species composition of corals also significantly be due to, you know, uh, this change in the uh, uh, or current of the water and the temperature. There was several forces of uh, a bleaching effect happened, and it has eradicated or uh, killed so much of uh, coral reefs. Many of them are known and many of them may be even not known. So even the climate change in certain species is going to have a much, much bigger impact on the, uh, you know, their survivability. Yeah. Then people always you know, had a habit of uh, voyaging and going to exp you know, exploring all the different parts of the land. Now it is all different uh, parts of the entire system, you know. And uh, at one point, a point of a time in the 17th century, and uh, this is a bird, Dodo, this is the one. Th this was there in the islands of Mauritius, and this has disappeared. You know, the reason for this kind of, uh, you know, disappearance, because of human, uh, you know, induced, the uh, human, uh, you know, uh, mediated uh, introduction of uh, alien species because people used to go to some of the area and pick up some of the animals and uh, when they are moving from uh, islands to island or land to land, some of the animals they have in, we don't know whether they have intentionally released or they have somehow got 
uh, you know, skip from the uh, ship or the, uh, uh, you know, with the, from them, those people, and got introduced to the new habitat. And the dodo, it is a big uh, bird and used to live on, uh, you know, terrestrial and even lay eggs on the, uh, you know, soil surface. And the egg used to be huge. And these rodents and the primates which were introduced to these islands started eating on the eggs of these birds. And they didn't directly eliminate these birds, but their number gradually gone down because the reproductive output was totally affected by these rodents and primates by removing their eggs. This has led to ultimately the uh, uh, no disappearance or extinction of uh, dodo. The another factor is the chemicals, uh, other, other chemicals that we use it as you know, uh, medicine also has caused a lot of uh, impact on various species. Here I'm giving an example that India has seen that vulture number at one point of a time used to be in thousands in, you know, in the single areas. It has become now very few at one point of a time, even it was thought that they might go totally extinct. And there was so much of effort was put to bring back this population. And you, you, the, the, why they, have, you know, it, they disappear? Because in uh, uh, veterinary science, in most of the, uh, because they are the birds of the scavengers, they used to eat the dead animals. Through these dead animals, that many of these, especially diclofenac and many other uh, 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 medicines used for in the veterinary cases, and it, there was a bioaccumulation happened. It affected their physiology, especially an renal system, and uh, it, uh, it affected their survival rate. And population had totally, you know, had gone down. And go government of India came up with the several programs to bring back this proper population, even you uh, know, captive breeding program, and they are investing so much of money and uh, on this captive program and for reintroduction of these birds to you know, nature. And uh, the, all these things is happening that is because of the human population. Why I told all these things? Because you should know, I know where the conservation biology took place. It's, uh, and uh, in 70s, that is the time, there was a meeting in San Diego. Almost global representatives were there. And there was a, this was a kind of a mega event. It happened and represented by uh, almost several, uh, you know, most of the countries uh, uh, from the, you know, uh, the uh, uh, globe. And this is the time, uh, these are all the crises were listed and prioritized as an important crisis that need to be addressed quickly. And uh, till that time, there was no concept of conservation biology. And that is the time the conservation biology term came. And also it was you know, considered that it, it became you know, the, as an independent discipline. And this is also considered as a, a sub subject discipline of crisis, basically. And the person who played a major role for the origin of this conservation biology is Dr. Michael Soule. Even he has written a series of books on this one, and he is a person that one. Basically, the attempt was to give a provider principles and tools to preserving biological diversity on Earth. But this science is not independent science as we study zoology or botany and many of these things. This is a kind of an integrated, it's a multidisciplinary science. It includes even social science, maybe even fisheries, even forestry, veterinary science, genetics, physiology, and all possible things 
uh, you know, required to understand this particular concept. Even understanding the psychology of the people is also important that we, you know, that time we understand even animals and their population. So with the economics play a role and the political uh, aspects play a role. So considering all these things, it is considered as that's why it, you know, multidisciplinary science. Now, the one of the uh, you know, goals set uh, during this time to preserve or uh, to have an uh, animal on the earth that first we have to prioritize the area for the, you know, to protect these animals. And then we have to bring under the concept of you know, protected area network. This is the one of the major concept it was introduced. Although many of the countries, one or another way, they had practiced keeping some of the patches in the name of a game, uh, a, 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 no sanctuary or a protected area or a different, uh, in the different names by different kings or uh, different rulers at that time. It was not streamlined till, you know, in the 70s. But that is the time globally kind of a major decision was, you know, taken. And the understanding of notification of protected areas got accelerated after this particular event. And even in India, if you look, look at it, uh, the one of the major law came is in 1972. That is wildlife Indian Wildlife Protection Act. You are keeping this particular you know, framework of the Wildlife Protection Act, India also started notifying the protected areas. And if you look at it, in the, you know, during the 1970s, we had only 68 protected areas. But in the recent years, if you look at it, we have almost reached 860. So why it didn't happen during this particular period? This has you know, taken over the time that we have added you know, many protected areas to this particular pool. That is, right now, uh, you know, we have almost protected 4.83% of a geographical area in the country and almost 100 national parks, 514 wildlife sanctuaries and 44 conservation reserve, four community reserve. This was a bit of a you know, couple of years back that I have used. Now we have many more community conservation reserves, 39 tiger reserve, 39 eight elephant reserves, and there are many other uh, you know, reserves for snow leopard, we have a program. Now for rhinos we have, for lions we have, for crocodiles we have. There are several uh, you know, concepts and frameworks are developed. But in the 1972, we, you know, the notification uh, of the protected areas came only for certain area and over the period we have added. Why? I didn't answer that one. Now I tell, uh, tell you that one because at that particular of a time, it was notified based on existing knowledge at that particular point of a time. And I didn't, I know keeping only of a few species and a few landscapes, it was notified. And over the period, as we started documenting, exploring our nature, we identified different landscapes, different patch of the forest, and many other endemic uh, uh, you know, species, endangered species, their potential population, that over the period, as the information started flowing, the even the protected area notification also started coming. That is what is it is the strengthening of protected area network. So, if you ask me the question, so then have you reached the maximum level that we have already achieved? I say no, because even in the recent years, after several decades, also we are adding many of the patches to this protected area network. This is one of the important goal, uh, you know, uh, uh, through this process that we can retain, we can protect uh, many species, many our landscapes and the biodiversity. 
So this is the pro concept of protected area network that we have, and this is one of the major element of uh, what we talked about the conservation biology and conservation, which was felt in seventies. Now I will take you people to the Western Ghats. This is a beautiful, uh, you know, forest stretches, and uh, this Western Ghats, where it is, it is India. In India, this is the kind, uh, you know, a, a west coast. It's a hill system runs parallel to the west coast up to Gujarat. Is the Western Ghats. This particular patch has been identified as one of the global biodiversity hotspot. And this, especially India, having you know several hotspots, contributes about eight percent of the global biodiversity. That means that India, you know, is holding so much of a life and has to play a major role in the conservation of the life on Earth. So here is the southern India I'm showing, and this is a beautiful, uh, you know, hill system that we have. This is the west coast, and uh, away from the west coast, even some places that Western Ghat touches almost the coast, but almost up the 40 kilometers distance that there is a hill system. But this particular hill system is also having two gaps. What this is, there is a one gap in southern uh, Western Ghats, and uh, this is in Tamil Nadu, and this is the pass to uh, you know, Tamil Nadu and Kerala. There is another almost 40, 45 kilometer of a gap that is here. Again, this is Tamil Nadu, and here it is Kerala. This is a called Palghat Gap. And this has played a major role in the uh, you know, life of many of our wildlife. So this is the hill system, Western Ghat. It is about 1,600 kilometer of a length and approximately width of about 100 uh, kilometer and uh, uh, one lakh 60,000 square kilometer of area is actually the Western Ghats. Now, the Western Ghats is basically divided into the several zones, uh, zones based on their characteristics. In the uh, especially somewhere in the Karnataka, little above Karnataka, this is the particular region, and the Yabo is having a di different type of a, uh, you know, geographical system and the forest structure and uh, the rainfall pattern and uh, humidity. All these components vary, keeping many of these factors that uh, north of this part is considered as northern. Uh, you know, zone of the uh, Western Ghats, and especially part of Karnataka and Goa and uh, Kerala uh, is considered, this particular region is considered as a central uh, Western Ghats. And uh, this is one of the main unique area, and this is a Nilgiris, and Nilgiris part is, comes under southern region. And some people even treat this particular zone as independent zone, that is a Nilgiri hill system. And this is the southern western Ghats. This is the southern western Ghats. And this is basically in the entire western Ghats stretch is uh, largely distributed from Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Goa, Maharashtra to Gujarat. Uh, sometime back, what we have done, and uh, we have mapped the distribution of uh, uh, all the mammals found in the western Ghats. And this Western Ghat is having somewhere around 130 species of mammals. And the just we wanted to see you know, the species richness, where the species richness is very high in the Western Ghat. If you see, the this is the map showing the species richness. And here, we have taken up only threatened species as listed in the IUCN and where these species are found. If you look at it, all these things, they are largely confined to the central and the southern western guard, especially to the Nilgiri biosphere, Anamalai Hills, Periyar landscape, and Agasthyamalai Hills. Nilgiri biosphere is the part of this system, and Anamalai is part of this system, and the Periyar part is the, almost the center, and the large part, this part is the Agasthyamalai Hill system. So this is what is the western guards. 
and the bit background of the for the western guards now i will take you to the species of the focus of the today that is light tail macaque in the western guards now india is having somewhere around 24 species of primates of that 10 macaques are you know, found in india out of 10 two macaques are confined to western guards one is bonnet macaque this is bonnet macaque, macaca radiata. This is recently considered as vulnerable, considering their population decline. And uh, land and macaque already in the endangered species list, as they are highly confined to the narrow stretch of the Western Ghats. So this land and macaque is confined, or you can say endemic to Western Ghats. The lion tailed macaque, this is the animal, uh, and uh, this is the distribution pattern of the lion tailed macaque. And uh, this species is, you know, why it is so important, why it is listed like, uh, uh, you know, it's important species, because of their certain traits. They are habitat specialists, largely confined to the rainforest of the Western Ghats. And even within the rainforest, they are highly specialist because they feed on only selected food. They are not a generalized, uh, a generalist like a bonnet macaque, rhesus macaque. They don't feed on all possible things, but they are highly even in the you know, tree. In the, if there is there are fruits, they don't pick up all the fruits and eat. They pick up a specific phenophase of the fruit and they pick up and they feed on that one. And also, the, uh, they have a long maturity period. And uh, in many of the cases, if you like um, a uh, rhesus macaque or a bonnet macaque, they mature early and they reproduce quickly. For example, bonnet macaque, with uh, three years, once the uh, female reaches the age, immediately she starts cycling and even in the, within the same year that she can re reproduce. But for the female of the uh, light tailed macaque, it takes four and a half to five and a half years to mature, and they breed very slowly also. That means that number of progeny that per female produce in her lifetime will be very less. But the, probably many of these characters of this particular uh, uh, species probably has led to less in number in the wild. So, what is that number in the wild? You know, that is very important you know, uh, information required to understand uh, or address the conservation challenges. Here I have, you know, keeping a lion tail macaque in the mind, I have listed a few of the uh, you know, important uh, uh, points here. That is population monitoring and with the appropriate method, it is very important to understand the population status. And fragmentation of its habitat is one of the crucial things that if it, something goes wrong with this population, then what can happen? Hunting pressure, population outside protected area network, habitat loss, NTFP collection and compo uh, you know, computation for resources, road and electrical lines, relocation of commensal animal. Many of these factors are important uh, you know, factors to address, understand and address the, the challenges of this particular species. I take one by one now, I go with the population status you know, issue. And uh, at one point of our time, very long back in 1970s, that Green and Minokovaski people who came from the, you know, outside and they studied the Western Guard. They are the people who are, gave a little bit of a more focused uh, work uh, on lion tail macaque in, in India, means the initial period of the study of this particular species. And uh, they pro projected the, uh, uh, you know, uh, about the 600 uh, uh, lion tail macaques maybe in the Western Guards based on their limited period of a study in southern western Ghats. Later, there was another study by Dr. Kurup and these people, and they projected there may be about 55. It is little more than what it was thought earlier. Later, uh, Rolf Ali and uh, you know, these people came up with a much more different number, and again, based on their much more extensive research in, uh, in the area. But later, you know, Kumar and, and 95 came up with a different type of a number. It is one of the biggest number it was projected. 
in the for the western ghats and it was same was again it was uh, 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 sealed by molu et al in 2003 and uh, this was the one number it was very well taken for the population of blind macar because the process that molu et al they carried out was calling out all the people who are working in the western cars and the, to work down the uh, primates and they conducted a kind of a workshop and then they uh, based on the, all those people's experience they pulled out the information then they developed a matrix of okay which area how many animals are there then they were able to project it that there is a possibility of about 3500 animals in 2003 and uh, in the recently when we have looked at it and uh, it is not that way different from the uh, earlier projected number of 3500 there is a 3500 to 4000 animal that we have projected for that uh, in a wild i would like to go to you know now different studies that is you know they have projected now th that earlier slide there it is for the entire western, western ghats and entire habitat but even i know my current focus is for the karnataka because this is the central western ghats and here you know what was the population and largely i take up you know information for the karnataka Karnataka itself, Dr. Karan projected about 3,500, but later then, you know, he projected that it is not correct. And then, uh, uh, because this entire projection was based on the secondary information collected, not seeing or not surveying the uh, uh, you know, animals on ground. And later he projected there is a possibility about, about 1,000 to 2,000 animals present in Karnataka. And, uh, but, in the 82 projected about four to five groups and current projected about six groups in Sisi Hanavara. This is the place and why I am talking about this particular place, I will come, you know, I, I will tell uh, later. Now I will just take you to Kerala and uh, in Kerala and uh, it was projected somewhere around 1216 macaques in 64 groups. It was a state level assessment was done by the department and this is the compiled information of the that entire thing and uh, this is where the population of blinded macaques are found and one of the places a perambicodon and uh, and this is the only three groups were projected with somewhere around uh, you know 57 there is a possibility of that one they could cite only seven individuals in three groups and this was the kind of a projection why I'm showing this one is because if we don't follow even appropriate method to assess the population, the clarity that it will, you know, it will not be there. What we have done is in the same area, we took a perambicodon and uh, this is the area of the perambicodon and uh, we selected the habitat that is actually of an evergreen forest and we gridded the uh, entire evergreen forest of this area. And then uh, uh, the, each grid size is uh, about a five square kilometer. Why we have selected five kilometer because their home range is somewhere around five square kilometer. That's what projected by Green and Minokovaski. And keeping that framework in the mind that we have projected the, uh, we have gridded the entire landscape. Uh, that each unit was considered as a sampling unit. And then we have walked this one with uh, four to five replications at each area. Then we located these many groups of the lighted macaque. And then ultimately it resulted then actually about 303 macaques in 17 groups. That's what was the projection. The, but in the entire landscape of the you know, Perambicodon, is, it is not a, just a single unit because the forest is contiguous with the other stretches. And then we have also plotted the, our uh, uh, you know, other documentation from the Anomalies and also Nelyamadi that provided somewhere around 63 groups of light and macaques are confined in this area. But they may be in a different fragments and the different stretches. And uh, there is also a good uh, you know, overall uh, population size and the mean group size is somewhere around 17. So 17 into 63, uh, that is what is the population size that is found in this anomaly health system. 
So why I'm projecting it, that systematic approach to understand their population is important. And uh, uh, that kind of a design and study only give a proper estimation of these animals. And keeping this type of a you know, framework, we also assess the population for several other uh, you know, part of the Western Ghats. This is Kalakadu Munotare Tiger Reserve, where we have documented about 30 groups and uh, somewhere around 462 animals. And uh, this is the uh, Thani area, this is Tamil Nadu part, where we have located very few groups, eight groups, but group size is so high here, and we have documented about 266 individuals. So over the period, the assessment we have conducted and started understanding the population of these animals. In the same way, even in the Karnataka also, we approached this in the same, uh, you know, with the systematic uh, framework for the population assessment. Here, we have selected the two places, Brahmagiri and Markut and Sissi Hanavara. This is southernmost point of the Karnataka and this is the northernmost point of the uh, Karnataka uh, light and macaque population area and uh, in the central western Ghats. And uh, here we have got uh, two contrasting uh, results. We, and uh, here it is the light and macaque, only one group we have got it. And but in the on, on the other hand, in Sirsi Hanavara, we have got about uh, 32 groups of uh, macaque and somewhere around 700 individuals. And similarly, we have also documented for the other patch. This is Kudremu complex, which is exactly in the center. And uh, entire stretch of uh, three protected areas. This is Kudremukh National Park, and this is Someshwara Wildlife Sanctuary, and this is Mukambika Wildlife Sanctuary. It's so a one single stretch of the forest. And uh, we documented the uh, light tailed macaques and also other uh, other primates. And uh, here earlier, Karanth reported somewhere around 42 group, 40 groups of light tailed macaques. But uh, in 2015, we were able to document only about 108 you know, groups. But still, I consider this is a very decent number of uh, 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 you know, population size occurs in this entire complex. And here I'm comparing the populations which was projected by Karanth and uh, the our recent uh, you know, findings. What it is, why I'm showing this one is that there are you know, uh, uh, important factors that we have to look at it, that there, uh, you know, some of the populations are so high but still persist, but some of the populations are totally disappeared. But in spite of all these things, that still Karnataka holds probably somewhere around 1,006, you know, 1,620 to 1,700 Makar in about 81 groups. That means still we hold a good population of lion-tailed Makar in Karnataka. But still, in spite of all these things, that though we have this population, but that population itself is not sufficient, as the the habitat is fragmented and in certain populations so shows that decline in the population that it has been listed as endangered and fragmentation of uh, its habitat is another factor and how, what will what will have you know this impact on the population for example one is the natural fragmentation that we have in many places and a uh, you know, population level. So all the populations, if we really plot it, it is, and there are many you know, discontinuity of these things, but though the forest is contiguous. But here there is already one major gap, it is already created. This gap, you know, it, it, earlier it, there was a kind of a forest, but though it is a different type of a forest, but over the period, Due to urbanization, though the, the you know God-wise there is a gap, forest continuity was there. Even that we have lost due to our own activities that affected the many wild animals, including lion-tailed macaque. This, uh, what extent this has affected this particular you know chart shows that almost that from several millions of years, these populations are already got affected. And uh, th this has kept the population, uh, uh, you know, uh, totally affect different. For example, here, uh, uh, no, here, yes. 
Okay, here this is the difference. This all the north north of Polgat Gap and also south of Polgat Gap from the prominent uh, individual populations. That means that from the last couple of you know thousands of years, probably you can say that one that activities has affected our, you know, the, because of the human activity, whatever the forest we have lost, that separated these two population. Now, though morphologically they look similar, but the genetically they're so diverged. And it is enough to call them as a subspecies or even as a species, but we have not done it because though uh, geographically, genetically, they are totally distinct, but from the other aspects, since we have not studied, we have kept it as distinct you know, populations, but genetically different populations. Hunting pressure. And as you, I have shown already this particular uh, you know, thing, but if you look at it, the reason for decline of the some, you know, population in some of the area and the persistence of other population, why? Why they have declined? And this decline we have addressed in a couple of our papers earlier, and we have showcased that in some of the area, especially southern part of the area, there is an indiscriminate hunting of many, you know, many of the primates. Primates are eaten, and uh, they, 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 that is not the meat of these animals are not, uh, you know, considered as different from the, any other uh, animals. So it is consumed, you know, in, in a lot, and also in they have added a value that they, you know, they may be having a kind of a medicinal value or kind of a thing. It may be just a belief system, but one or another reason that they have been severely hunted, and the population shows that drastic decline but it still persists in some of the patches. And Sirsi Honavara, as I have pointed out in the previous one, it was a population, it was outside protected area. This is the you know, population. This, you know, during the, my survey, I have identified this population in 2001 and 2002. And this population, as I have projected already earlier, you know, have somewhere around 650 animals. But what is the issue in this particular population? The population, you know, this is the reserve forest. Forest is continuous, but, and also less hunting pressure because the belief system here is different than in the southern area. Here, all the primates are considered as Hanuman. There is a kind of a god and people avoid hunting of these animals, though they hunt on many other deeds and other animals that the, uh, uh, the pressure on these you know, primates are relatively less. It's because of such relatively less pressure, still that population could manage in spite of so much of a habitat is encroached and converged, con uh, you know, converted into agricultural feed. And there are somewhere around about uh, you know, 15,000 people reside in these areas. So they leave the people in the reserve forest and uh, in between the agricultural uh, you know, habitat with the remnant forest patches. In that case then, if there is, though there is no hunting pressure on these animals, but if there is a habitat conversion, obviously it will have a big impact on this population. It might lead to the you know, uh, uh, fragmentation of the habitat can have a, again different type of an impact on the population. Then we looked at it that, okay, if that is the case, then what we have to do for that particular population to understand that one. So where are all the major populations are found? When we have looked at these major populations, if you really look at it that, okay, uh, 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 this is the 30 you know, groups in Kalkandu Mundatare, this is in Tamil Nadu. And uh, this is one of the largest uh, tract of the forest, but still the number of individuals are less. And when you, you compare with the all other populations in the different parts of the Western Ghats, it may be Anamalais, or it may be in the Periyar system, Silent Valley, or Kudremu complex even, that if you compare you know, to all these patches, actually, this is the one you know, patch, this is the patch having highest number of individuals and highest number of uh, uh, you know, contigu uh, individuals in a contiguous patch that we have it. But the issue is that non-protected area. 
So the one of the major focus was that we have to bring this entire landscape or entire this area under the protected area network was a kind of a challenging thing. It came uh, you know, in front of us. What we have done is we approached the department, then we have showcased that this all these things. Then the department came up with that uh, we don't know, you know, it's the research work that you people have done it, but now we will do together, then only we will be able to, uh, you know, give a value to your findings. So then what I did is basically I interacted with the, all the you know, stakeholders and all the people and the, then department came up with the funding and with the department, forest department, then we did the second assessment somewhere around seven and eight period. That is the time also the consistency and persistence of the population are somewhere around 600 to the 700 individual was showcased and that we have published later. And in that project, in that you know, assessment of the thing that we submitted the report to the Karnataka Forest Department showcasing that this is the core area and buffer area by demarcating that this is where we have to make a kind of a protected area. And uh, this is the report that we have submitted and uh, you know, to the department, the person from the Paris department also involved in this entire exercise. And uh, in, uh, after all this report and everything, and uh, uh, you know, almost 20 to 30 presentations that we had to make it and uh, convince different stakeholders because coming out with any protected area is not easy because it's uh, land from a, one status to shifting to the another state uh, requires a major decision by the policy makers or the decision makers. So convincing to do that one is one of the major challenging work. Here, our, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Vijay Mohan Raj also played a major role. He was a DFO of the area. He also presented and showcased this one and attempted to convince the decision makers. <clears throat> After all the all those effort, ultimately, this has led to the notification of the conservation reserve. That one is Adhanashini Lion-Tailed Macaque Conservation Reserve that we came up with the new protected area for the lion-tailed macaque. And uh, this is the uh, protected area that was notified. And uh, this not only supports the conservation of lion-tailed macaque, this is the area is very important for the even king cobra. And there's a very unique uh, swamp system having uh, many uh, 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 you know, endemic species found in these spaces, both the plants and also amphibians. And uh, also it supports many uh, you know, new species of uh, uh, frogs in this area. So in the recently, again, it was felt that this, is, this conservation reserve is not just enough. This has to be upgraded. And then it was merged with the neighboring one of the uh, wildlife sanctuary. It was a Sharavati Valley Wildlife Sanctuary. Now they merged these two protected area and new, notified this as Sharavati Valley lion tailed maca sanctuary because even Sharavati wildlife sanctuary is also having a lion tailed maca but it was already a sanctuary with, with very few individuals of the macaques about six to seven groups but now it, they put together totally it has become somewhere around 40 groups of lion tailed macaque area has come under uh, overall uh, the protected area network is that enough for the uh, you know, conservation of the, uh, this animal. There are many other issues also we need to address in this kind of a protected area. One of the issue is relocation of commensal species. This is uh, uh, another species, basically, the uh, you know, bonnet macaque. Bonnet macaque is largely found in the uh, much more larger area from the urban habitat to the remotest forest area. And uh, th this species has been considered as pest at many places and uh, uh, because they go uh, ride the crop and they do damage to the, especially the farmers. And uh, because of all these things, the kind of a, uh, they have put a kind of a tag on this animal that it is the problematic, problematic animal. 
and it is considered as a pest. And uh, so, attitude of the people is very negative to this, uh, you know, species. What happens in the, you know because of all these uh, things that uh, animals from the urban area or the villages or from the uh, you know cropland that, that they are captured from those areas and it was taken to the uh, nearest habitat area and they are released. If they do it like that, if they release these animals, then what will happen? Because when these animals are exposed to the different habitat type, different foods, and uh, uh, where they spend more time on the many other domesticated animals, there is a possibility of exchange of many of the parasites, especially in uh, you know endoparasites. So then if they are loaded with this endoparasite, there is a kind of a fear that they might transfer these things to the even the uh, uh, habitat specialist like animals like the lion and macaque. Here, there are many such instances that happened. Many bonnet macaque groups were introduced to this northern population of a lion tailed macaque, where that is the you know, proper, uh, protected area is notified. And uh, many groups were relocated from the neighboring uh, you know, villages or towns or temples or from even agricultural field to this particular habitat. But when they translocated the animals are not screened for the you know health or the endoparasites or any of the other issues because it is very crudely it is done and they were straight away captured and taken there and released and it, it has resulted in the major impact on the light and maca for example if you look at it here uh, no, this is the lion-tailed macaque. It is in the, uh, you know, Chicxulli. This is in the, our Sissi Kondawara area. And here it is the uh, uh, you know, lion-tailed macaque in the animal health system. Here, this is the bonnet macaque, which are released to the Sissi Kondawara, this particular population. If you really uh, look at the endoparasite pattern, bonnet macaque in Chicxulli is having the highest similarity, more than 50% similarity of endoparasites with the lion-tailed macaques that they coexist. But that is uh, you know, totally different. The similarity between the endoparasites, between the animals in the Chicxulli, means in our Sissi Honavara area, to the anomalical system is only just to 20%. That means there is an 80% variation in state. But here, the similarity is the so much that indicates that there is a possibility of the endoparasites what is found in the bonnet macaque probably has already gone to the lightened macaque is one of the major issue that need to be addressed another issue that is habitat loss and ntfp collection and com uh, competition for resources road and electric lines in for this conservation of these animals I will take uh, another issue of the lion tailed macaque. This is one of the important things that we look at it. And we have also studied the you know, feeding habit of uh, lion tailed macaque. And uh, there, one of the major food source you know, here is a caryota urans. And also, they feed on jackfruit and uh, many other species here. Here, we understood what they feed, basically. And, but just understanding what they feed is not enough from the point of a conservation. Here, what we have done is, uh, you know, uh, uh, we have, uh, you know, what these species, what are all the many of these species also used by people as an NTFP. That is another major thing that we have looked at it. One of the most common thing that people use is Garcinia gamigata. This is Upage and Miristica species. And uh, these three species, I'm going to highlight it right now here. And their livelihood depends somewhere on uh, you know, 30 to 13 to 14% uh, 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 on NTFP by these people. That means their large proportion of livelihood actually also depends on the NTFP collection, especially some of these lovely state plant species. If you look at you know, the bag, this Garcinia gamigata, also one of the uh, food tree, uh, you know, uh, here and uh, here also, uh, um, this overall, ah, okay, Chicxulli in here. 
Okay. And uh, this is also major food, especially in the uh, rainy season. That is the main uh, no, time period. Especially in a monsoon time, this becomes a major food in the uh, 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 diet of the lion tailed maca. That means its role is important in their diet. So that is also important, uh, you know, for the people as an NTFP because their livelihood is dependent. So if that is the kind of a situation, then what we have to do it? Where this is going basically? Why people are you know collecting this one? Because the lot of antacids are you know, produced actually is from the garcinia group of our plants especially from the garcinia the migata and this is only in a monsoon period when it grows and they collect and they dry it and these dried ones are taken to the uh, companies and it is sold here and uh, the, the companies that extract the you know they require the, uh, the you know, chemicals from this and produce the uh, medicine out of this one but here, they, there are two issues that need to be addressed. One is the overlap of the food between the uh, lion-tailed macaque and the people, and also the way that they process the, uh, these fruits, because they use quite a lot of wood to dry these uh, you know, fruits, in the, especially in the wet season. Uh, that, that uh, since it is in the wet season, the amount of wood required that is uh, you know, huge and comes from the forest. So there are two issues that need to be we need to understand. So uh, here there is a high overlap and uh, uh, with uh, Garcinia gamigata by people and also uh, by lantern macaque. And another issue is Meristica malabarica and dactyloides, which is a major food in many other parts of the Western Ghats for the lion-tailed macaque. Though this species is also found in this particular area, but never seen them feeding on it because the, these uh, you know, species are harvested much earlier than they reaching a specific phenophase that is used by the lion-tailed macaque. So because of this one, they harvest early, so it is not available, that's why they are not eating. So many of these factors affects the basically dietary component of the lion-tailed macaque. And the one is overlap and non-availability of some of these things and the competition exists. And because of over exploitation of the forest wood and uh, for the processing of uh, uh, you know, this Garcinia gamigata and also uh, habitat conversion. And we have just showcased that what is happening to the habitat of lion-tailed macaque. Here, if you really look at it, this is what is the evergreen forest in uh, you know, 89 and uh, in a 2000 that has become drastically, it has come down. So that means that habitat conversion is already in place. And because of one or another reason, then if it is not stopped, then it becomes a major issue. In that case, then what we have to do it, that is, a, that is another issue. Then the electric line because there are about 15 thousands of people are there in this area and uh, each home requires a power supply when the power supply is provided to each home it, they can keep increasing the power line in the entire area so increased the power line ultimately resulted in the uh, an electrocution and killing of these animals that has eliminated so many lion-tailed macaque in the habitat. This is then we have mapped the all crucial uh, you know, electric lines in the in this entire area. And if you if I you know just to recap some of the information what I have projected so far. See, this is one of the largest population, and this is a reserve forest and having a high density of uh, humans. And there was also kind of a proposal for the eight mini hydro projects. And also there's so much of demand for the you know, agriculture. They use a lot of green manure. And there is a high overlap in the resource used by people and the uh, lion tailed macaque. There is also habitat loss due to firewood used by trying of Garcinia gamigata. There is a continuous expansion of the road and also electric line. And the, uh, already, as I have projected, yes, we no, uh, you know, got notification and got upgraded area as a uh, protected area is one of the major steps it was taken. But that itself is not sufficient. 
So several other management aspects are also taken up to have a conservation in this area. Instead of using, you know, for a drying of these uh, fruits, uh, uh, to reduce the use of the forest uh, and of firewood from the forest, if the almond systems are, you know, different type of almond systems are introduced, that would help them to reduce using the, uh, you know, firewood collection. So that different type of uh, almond systems were introduced to dry this Garcinia gummigata. This can dry, you know, almost 10% of the real wood that they use it for the drying of these things. And this has reduced quite a lot of use of uh, firewood in the landscape. Then sustainable harvesting system was introduced and uh, then it was mediated by the forest department. The committee was formed and uh, earlier the harvest, you know, local people used to harvest and uh, at a range level, the, the, uh, the department used to auction it. And uh, in auction, some of the person from somewhere, they used to take it action uh, in action to collect these fruits and supply to the company. But when we have stopped this one, it uh, the, then it was decided that village forest committee should handle all these things. So then we can have a control over kind of a harvesting of these things. So then the some quantity of these fruits to be kept are left in the white. So then through this process that even we can regulate the NTFP uh, collection and what they have to collect and how much they have to collect and also they should get more benefit out of this entire thing than the earlier if we stop the you know middleman so this is the one it you know we introduced it and it is in a you know place then as you know because it is not only in that particular place that there is a dec decline in the habitat this shows that, you know, in uh, 70s habitat and the current habitat, there's quite a lot of the habitat uh, loss. Only this can be addressed through restoration program. Then we convinced the, all the nurseries in the region to be converted to the local uh, 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 nursery for the native places and uh, introduce all the species that is of a native that is used by required by you know local people and also for the animals keeping certain species and not only the lion-tailed macaque even many other frugivorous species it was so that most of the nurseries were uh, converted into the native species and it is really doing good and taking back into these plants and wherever it has been highly exploited, denuded, and those inter, you know those patches, these plants were introduced. So through this one, so bring back the forest, natural forest. And all the next step initiation was taken that we were able to convince that uh, the power line is, uh, you know, if it is insulated, we can bring down the effect of uh, our electrocution rate on uh, many of the wild animals, including the lion-tailed macaque. And it is so expensive phenomenon, but ultimately when we have, uh, you know, given this proposal to the department, department took it in a positive way and they then they took it to the power corporation department and they were able to convince and half of the area now, this in, in, in the entire this landscape is insulated. So, in, uh, you know, uh, so that it reduces uh, quite a lot of mortality of the light and maca. Uh, uh, you know, due to electrocution. So those are all the activities that we have done it. And uh, not only just coming out with a protected area and many, uh, you know, management uh, contributions that we have, uh, we have done it. And slowly there is a quite a lot of changes we are trying to bring to save these animals. And, uh, the, but many of these things we could achieve it because we had the science that means research, findings, facts, and figures that is coming from conservation biology study through that one and achieving the conservation on ground. So if we have a proper facts and figures, making a conservation success is not difficult. That's what I would like to say. And through that, you know, I, 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 uh, I would like to thank all the organizers and also many of, I, I, I could do, achieve you know, many of these things 
uh, uh, Lord Professor Meva Singh and many other people that many of all these people supported in this entire work. And uh, thank you. Thanks to Ananda. And uh, and uh, the, the forum can be open for the now questions if people have any questions. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Sorry, for I took quite a lot of time, little more time than the expected. And, uh, no problem. Uh, very uh, knowledgeable. Uh, so thank you very much, sir, for uh, such a knowledgeable uh, You have told very good information about conservation history of Lauri Bell in Nagar. Uh, we can see a lot of comments gathered with a lot of applications like the informative session, knowledgeable session, this session and many more. Uh, have some queries of the participants. Uh, uh, Sir, one of participants have asked, Sir, why today sparrow are extinct? Sparrows are, are not really got a, extinct. They are not really on decline. At one point of a time, globally, of course, you know, it was declined. Recently, in uh, our institute, they conducted a nation level survey assessment. It showcases the, the probably the report will come out in uh, one or two months. It showcases that the it is bouncing back. The population is coming back, especially uh, in uh, in a rural you know areas. Still, they are doing good. And wherever we have a different kind of a uh, thatched system and uh, food grains available, they are doing good. Even in certain uh, you know towns, though we think that is a total concrete uh, area, but if you go outside the uh, you know completely outskirts of the these town systems, also the uh, the populations of the sparrows have been seen. That means whether they are bounced back or uh, they have been there, that it is not documented. That is also a possibility. Okay, but uh, since it was not noticed in the uh, many of the urban system, it was felt that population has probably gone. But uh, the real facts will come in a couple of just months. But population is there, and really they have not gone extinct. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Next question: are, uh, Ecological factors of the number of macaques compared to the forest number. Mm -hmm. The see the, the, as I have pointed out, uh, if there is a less, uh, it is for, for first of all, lion-tailed macaque is confined to the evergreen forest. If there is a good evergreen forest without any hunting pressure, without much uh, you know fragmentation, that's where the lion-tailed macaques are. There. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, this from our because macaques are not How can you identify them? Uh, I have shown the figures. Lion tailed macaque is completely black animal with a short tail and having a white mane. But a uh, bonnet macaque is completely pale brown color and without any mane and a long tail. Morphologically, they are too distinct. I know it is easy to make out. Even you know, the, if you really look at that way, the uh, bonnet macaque is more similar to uh, other similar species like probably rhesus macaque found in Madhya Pradesh and uh, other area. But still, you know, morphologically they are very distinct because tail length is uh, so much vary. Their facial structure is you know entirely different. Their head hair pattern is different. Morphologically they are all distinct. It is easy to make. Okay. Uh, so next question is: Can special effort be taken by 4.5 from the female macaque so that it evolves in breeding, or is it normal? That is very interesting question, but uh, I know I don't know. I don't have an answer for this question because keeping that one in the mind, and uh, no, no, no one has really looked at these animals, uh, you know, that way, and. Uh, Yes, but we have a data. I think we can just see it, but I, I don't have a ready-made answer for that question. Sorry for that one, but uh, it's an interesting question, but we don't have answer. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, so next question is, plantings of Garshi the wild can improve the population? Uh, uh, I don't know, but at least if we stop the fragmentation that 
population will remain as a single population. If there is a fragmentation, we don't know what happens to those population because it can have a cascading effect that some, because what we have observed already in Anamala Hills, that some of the uh, groups have really gone down and they're not reproducing. But in the same time, in some of the fragments, they're reproducing more also. There is a opposite patterns have been seen in one of the patch, the number is just going high. But on the other hand, there are fragments that population has not changed over the period. But in certain patches, it has gone down also. So we don't know how, what is the consequence of this kind of a thing happens on these animals. But the, because of uh, at least many you know, other factors that population has gone down in many other places, it may be largely due to uh, hunting pressure and uh, loss of habitat. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, so uh, reduce human population to conserve ecosystem, the only way or stop modernization to conserve wildlife over population is the main problem. Comment, please. So this question is asked of by... Of course, Spencer. that is very well-known phenomenon that human population, the number has gone, not only for uh, even a wild animals, even for humans also tomorrow it become a problem because the way we are exploiting our resources tomorrow, even to eat if we convert all the you know, habitat land, uh, agriculture or fail, even we compete ourselves. Because today, the one kilo of rice may be 100 rupees. Tomorrow, if it becomes 1,000 rupees, imagine what will happen. Okay. Now, you, if you look at it, even globally, in most of the area, that, of course, you know, because of uh, increase in the human population, we have been encroaching the, you know, continuously the wild habitat. And now wild habitat is becoming a fragment. Every protected area, protected area network, if you look at it, they're all in bits and pieces, you know, are, are, are scattered in the entire country. And uh, well, that is one of the, of course, major, uh, you know, impact. But if we at least retain those patches, at least, so then... Some of these populations will try for some time. Okay. Thank you, sir. Last question. How identify their near family? Uh, this question is asked by. Uh, you can see the question in the audience. Yes, yes, I could see. Okay, like similar. How they are identified their near ones and the family. See, basically, they have a kind of a, a, a chemical odor, uh, you know, relationship and uh, a kind of a, a, you know, chemical interaction. That's why there is also chemical ecology. There is a beautiful field, that one. And also their communication system that they, that kind of, they, how we recognize our own people morphologically and their vocalization, you know, that, that one. And in, in almost the same way, they also have a kind of a system that they recognize their individual. It's through chemical you know, process and also morphologically and vocalization. Oh, for solving what more comments and there are not too many activities. Now moving the program ahead, I invite Professor Head Zilogy Technology Department and convener of the program for giving concluding remarks. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Shashwa. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Kumara, sir. You are excellent presentation and nicely explaining the conservation story of Western Ghats. Thank you, sir. Your slides are so nice, sir. Very nice slides. And your language was also simple and understandable. Really, it is mind-blowing and knowledgeable. I salute you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you madam. Sir. It is very knowledgeable, sir, and mind-blowing, sir. And I, I hope ever, everybody must be benefited with your talk. Once again, I thank you on behalf of my institution. Thank you, sir, for sharing your knowledge and views and spent your precious time with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Thanks for giving this opportunity to share some of our uh, you know, stories. And uh, really, I had a good time. Thank you. Thank you, 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 you
now for further conduction over to shashwat sir shashwat sir thank you ma'am uh, now i invite dr associate professor chemistry department for posing both of thanks for you sir agrawal sir thank you sir sir good afternoon to everyone kd agrawal this is set of crop chemistry government was it is such a honor for me to get the opportunity to thank the committee on behalf of the body and technical department and i extend nearly honorable guest speaker dr honavali pen kumara conservation of biology salmal center Mukhaji, Natural History, Abdulalim, Conservation Story, Western Ghat, and without time, I'm busy schedule. I am immensely thankful to our respected principal, that that has to do the best. I would like to thank. Lina Lakhani, head of Zoology Biotechnology Department, and convener of the webinar for organizing such a wonderful seven days e-awareness program on wildlife conservation in India. Dr. Lakhani, Madam, के बारे में एक बात मैं और जानना चाहूँगा कि Madam इसी महा लगभग seven वर्ष होने जा रही हैं, लेकिन आज भी वो अपने students के सुनेरे भविष्य के लिए लगातार वेबिनार व अन्य शैक्षणिक गतिविधियों का आयोजन कर रही हैं उनके इस जज्बे को सलाम मैडम बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद थैंक यू थैंक यू सर आई थैंक्स टू मिस्टर शाश्वत निगम फैकल्टी ऑफ बायोटेक्नोलॉजी फॉर कंडक्टिंग प्रोग्राम एंड आई आल्सो थैंक टू मिस शिवा खान फैकल्टी ऑफ बायोटेक्नोलॉजी फॉर गेस्ट इंट्रोडक्शन आई वुड लाइक टू एक्सप्रेस माई ग्रेटिट्यूड टू ऑल पार्टिसिपेंट फॉर देयर प्रेजेंस टू मेक this webinar a great success i thank to ms shiva khan and shashwat nigam for technical support again i thank to all of you once again thank you kumara sir on behalf of my institution thank you thank you so much sir now we conclude today's uh, session we will meet again tomorrow at 11 am uh, aap logon ko chat box par फीडबैक लिंक शेयर की जा रही है और फीडबैक लिंक को भरने के बाद ही आप मीटिंग को लीव करेंगे फीडबैक लिंक भरते समय आप लोग अपनी ईमेल आईडी को सही से लिखेंगे और गलत होने पर फिर आपको सर्टिफिकेट्स नहीं पहुंच पाते हैं तो कल तक के लिए जय हिंद जय भारत